Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're here to thank you. <laughs> We're here today to both mark an important occasion in the history of Amherst, the 60th anniversary of President John F. Kennedy's dedication of Frost Library, and to recommit ourselves as a college to the challenge that President Kennedy issued to this institution and to our peers. The library being constructed today, President Kennedy said, this college itself, all of this, was not done merely to give the school's graduates an advantage, an economic advantage in the life struggle. It does do that. But in return for that, in return for the great opportunity which society gives the graduates of this and related schools, it seems to me incumbent upon this and other schools graduates to recognize their responsibility to the public interest. Privilege is here and with privilege goes responsibility. All of us who attend, who teach, who work in this place, this Amherst, have inherited both that privilege and that responsibility. Therefore, now, six decades after Kennedy's famous speech, now is the time for this college to rededicate ourselves to educating students for democracy, to building and promoting a culture among our students in which their Amherst experiences will prepare them for a lifetime of contributing to the greater good. That work is as urgent as it was when President Kennedy spoke here so eloquently here, and perhaps even more so. We live at a moment when the problems that face us often seem insurmountable, when cynicism, anxiety, and mistrust in institutions can seem overwhelming. When we first started planning tonight's conversation, I did not anticipate that it would take place in the context of the devastating violence and staggering loss of life in the Israel-Hamas war, the terrorist attacks on Israel, and the widening humanitarian crisis in Gaza. So many innocent lives have been lost, and these events have directly and indirectly impacted many members of the Amherst family, harming or putting at risk loved ones and loved communities. These events have sharpened our resolve to rededicate ourselves to educating students for democracy and service to the world, to building and promoting a culture among our students in which their Amherst experiences will prepare them for a lifetime of contributing to the greater good. In this moment of upheaval, when so many of us are feeling despair, I understand that some in this room may wish to disrupt or even shut down tonight's event I urge you to reconsider and instead use your voices to spark conversations rather than silencing them. Protest and dissent are vital parts of a democracy, but silencing our planned speakers not only prevents others in the audience from engaging with ideas and forming their own opinions, it precludes us from learning from and with one another. In a world beset by issues that are global in scale, our educational endeavor rests on the capacity of our students to grow in their intellect and imagine brighter futures for us all, and on something that too often seems in short supply right now, hope. Part of our charge here at Amherst is to provide our students a sense of hope and optimism about their capacity to translate a liberal arts education into meaningful contributions to a free and just society. By embracing the greater good on a diverse, pluralist campus like ours, one that prizes difference of opinion and allows space for disagreement while holding fast to the practice of civil discourse, we demonstrate the ultimate value of a learning community as a laboratory and a classroom that produces insightful leaders for the world far beyond this campus. At Amherst, we can model what it means for a community to embrace the complexity of its own history and face the past in service of a better future. We can show our students that their experiences and their academic work will enable them to build civic communities in which there's room for both disagreement and accord 
and where we practice the skills that the everyday life of democracy requires. Today, therefore, as we look backward and look forward, I'm recommitting Amherst to these ideals and asking all of us to work together toward our common purpose of serving the greater good. I want to recognize just a few of the campus endeavors already in progress toward this vision, as well as some concrete step, steps the college will be taking in four core areas, our classrooms, our career programs, our campus culture, and our community. First, I want to recognize the faculty who have been developing courses under the Thinking Democratically Initiative, led by Austin Serrett, and share that I'll be extending the funding for that curricular initiative. I will also be inviting proposals from other faculty to develop courses that enhance Amherst's commitment to preparing our students to serve the greater good. That could include community partnerships or courses that connect students across disciplines to the problems facing our democracy. Second, I want to recognize the work of the student-led Better Amherst Initiative and our Loeb Center for Career Exploration and Planning to expand support for careers in public service. This year, the Loeb Center is launching a new Interns for Democracy program that will support paid summer internships for democracy-oriented organizations. And thanks to the generosity of Sandy Rosenberg the, from the class of 1972, graduating students are eligible for social impact grants if they choose to work in the nonprofit sector. I'm deeply grateful to have partners like Sandy in this work his long and generous connection to Amherst has inspired and supported our students to make positive contributions to society through public service, and it's an honor to build on what he started. Today, I'm very pleased to announce that for the next three years, the college will match the income from the endowment that Sandy has created so that we double the number of Rosenberg Summer Senior Grants and I'll be seeking support from other alumni to extend that impact even further. Third, we must work all to create a campus culture in which students feel free to dispute and disagree with one another with respect and engagement. To that end, I'm happy to recognize the work of Professor Martha Umphrey, who through her class on law, speech, and the politics of freedom, has been leading the Open Minds Project, an initiative that will invite students to hear opposing arguments on a single question to ask questions of their own, and to learn from each other the art of democratic engagement. Endeavors like these can model the kind of discourse so often absent in contemporary society, and even facilitate students changing their minds or shifting their thinking on the most challenging issues of our time. Finally, our commitment to the greater good requires support for the communities that surround us. It means being honest and humble about our own history, and looking for new ways to partner with both the town of Amherst and other organizations that advance these ideals. To that end, I'm pleased to announce that we are marking the 60th anniversary of the dedication of Frost Library with a donation of $1 million to the town's Jones Library building project. <laughs> We recognize at Amherst that libraries in any community are essential democratic institutions, making knowledge accessible to all and serving as a gathering place for everyone. These actions are not the end of our commitment, our recommitment to the greater good. The best ideas will not, I assure you, come from the president, at least this president, but from all of you. Because if democracy teaches us anything, it teaches us that we can find joyful purpose and real solutions to real problems in speaking to and even better listening to one another. As we inaugurate this new chapter in Amherst's journey, I'm delighted we have the opportunity to listen together to this night, to this evening's special guest. Before launching into tonight's conversation with the governor, I want to introduce two community members working to advance the future of democracy. I'm delighted to invite to the stage Theo Dassin and Aidan Orr from the class of 2024, co-founders of Amherst Students for Democracy.
Hi, my name is Aiden. And my name is Theo. And we are co-founders of Amherst Students for Democracy. Thank you to the college, in particular the President's Office and the Office of Communications for organizing this event and for allowing us to speak tonight. And thank you to Governor Healy for coming today. It's an honor to have you here. Democracy is in peril. From the erosion of civil liberties and the rise of autocratic leaders to the proliferation of disinformation and the weakening of democratic institutions, the principles and practices of democracy are under attack. We know that Amherst students are committed to bettering the world around them. Our student body has a storied history of championing social causes. We've both seen firsthand the passion that Amherst students bring in their fights for progress, and we know that there's no limit to the change that we are capable of. Wanting to harness this energy, Professor Serrett gave us the idea for the pledge campaign. Our goal with this campaign is to have every single Amherst student at some point during their time here to work for a pro-democracy organization. It's easy as students committed to change to be disillusioned with American democracy. But we're not asking you to fight for things to stay the same. We're calling on you to make the reality of democracy match the ideals of freedom, equity, and justice that we've always been told about. We also recognize that the fight for democracy is bigger than one college student, or even one college. But there are countless organizations bettering democracy, and we can supply them with the energy and commitment of Amherst students. Completing the pledge can come in many forms, from working for a summer at a nonprofit combating misinformation, to volunteering a weekend or two to register voters in your hometown. We've worked closely with the Loeb Center, alums, and student volunteers to ensure that every single student who takes the pledge will have an opportunity to work for a pro-democracy organization. There's no shortage of ways to contribute. Our goal is making sure that when you sign up for the pledge, you can make a substantive impact. You can sign up to take the pledge tonight, right outside this room with one of our volunteers. We will also have tables to sign up outside Val, Frost, and the Science Center for the rest of the week. JFK, in his inaugural address, said, in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. We are one of those few generations. Democracy is under attack. Are you willing to fight for it? Then take the pledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Theo and Aiden. Tonight's guests of honor, Maura Healy, is the 73rd governor of Massachusetts. In 2022, she became the state's first woman and first openly LGBTQ person elected to that position. On her first day in office, her first day in office, Governor Healy appointed the nation's first cabinet-level climate chief and created the Office of Climate Innovation and Resilience to coordinate policies across all of the state government to address the climate crisis. In her first year as governor, Healy has already delivered on key promises to help Massachusetts become a leader in clean energy, a more affordable and equitable place to live, and a great place for businesses to operate. She has prioritized education and workforce development by making free school meals for K-12 students permanent and creating a free community college program for residents ages 25 and older. She's made historic investments in apprenticeships and other career pathways. She's delivered on her promise to make Massachusetts more affordable by cutting taxes for the first time in 20 years, including creating the most generous child and family tax credit in the country.
Governor Healy previously served two terms as Massachusetts Attorney General, elected in 2014 and 18. Her role as the people, in her role as the people's lawyers, she took on difficult issues impacting Massachusetts residents, including the opioid epidemic, the climate crisis, escalating healthcare costs, and student loan debt. Earlier in her career, Healy was a prosecutor in Middlesex County and a litigation partner at Wilmer Hale. Governor Healy grew up in New England, the oldest of five siblings raised by their mother, Tracy, who worked as a nurse at the local elementary school. Her stepfather, Edward, was a teacher and a local union president. He coached her high school basketball team and instilled a lifelong love of the sport. She attended Harvard College, nobody's perfect, <laughs> where she captained the basketball team and then spent two years as a starting point guard on a professional basketball team in Austria. For much of her career, Governor Healy has been the only woman in the room, and she has taken every opportunity to elevate other women. She is a passionate advocate for LGBTQ rights, women's health, and equality in general. Please join me in welcoming to Amherst College, Massachusetts Governor Maura Healy. Governor Healy, we are so pleased to have you here on this historic occasion of the college. I want to start, we have a small gift for you. Oh, I think well, you thank take you. Take a look. It's a little thank something. Thank you for the warm welcome. Remind me of which team you're playing for. <laughs> oh, how about this? <laughs> I think you even got the number right. Yeah. And you got the number right. Thank you very much. Great. I will wear this in good health. I'm not playing as much basketball these days as I should be, so this will, this will inspire me. Good, Thank you so good. much for having me. Well, we're so pleased to have you here. Maybe we can start just by talking about your pathway to public service. When I read the biography of somebody like you, you know, it almost seems scripted, but maybe it didn't always feel the way at the time. You know, tell us about the journey from the basketball court to, uh, to the state house. Wow. Um, well, I guess I'd say a few things. First of all, it was not scripted at all. Mm -hmm. um, I never imagined running for office. I never imagined really being in politics. Um, and I think that's something I want to say to folks out here, especially some of the younger folks, because I can tell you when I was in college, I did not know what I wanted to do when I got out of school. I thought maybe I'd go to law school. That was always something that appealed to me. But beyond that, I really did not know. It's probably why at 21 when I graduated, I decided to take an easy route and go to Europe, see the world, play pro basketball, buy some time. <laughs> um, I went to a school where there were any number of people who talked openly about running for office. I was not uh, in, engaged that way like whatsoever. Um, I grew up in a small town. I was raised for the most part by a single mom who worked as a nurse and, and worked multiple jobs. And I'm the oldest of five um, and went to public school in Seacoast, New Hampshire. And, um, you know, was taught a lot about just hard work and putting the time in. I applied to different colleges and, you know, I ended up uh, staying relatively close to home. I continued to waitress through college and law school, actually. I'd say my second most favorite job um, was probably that of a cocktail waitress at a place that still exists, the Hampton Beach <laughs> Casino, and probably learned as much about life uh, through that experience as I did four years at, at Harvard in many respects. And it's just to say that um, I was open to experiences, and that's ultimately what ended up happening. I practiced for many years at a big international law firm. I loved the work that I did, but I had an opportunity to sort of do a 180 at one point in my life about eight or nine years in, and that was to run the Civil Rights Division for Massachusetts for the State Attorney General's Office. And it was there that I was able to see the power of public service in action when we filed a lawsuit challenging the Defense of Marriage Act and were able to secure equality. When we investigated... Uh, well, 
when we investigated the Sacklers for their, their, the terrible damage they, they wrought through the opioid crisis, you know, it was seeing the power of, of public service and action. That's what inspired me to run to be Attorney General. Doing the work as Attorney General then inspired me to, to run to be governor. So incredibly unlikely path, but for me the lesson was, I guess, uh, being open to, to new changes and, 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 and experiences and trying to, to follow what seems right to you in your gut, in your heart, at a given moment. Terrific. Well, let me switch gears a little bit and invite you to challenge us a little bit. Uh, so we're gathered today at a private institution, like your, your alma mater, that's seeking to think about its role in serving the public good. How do you see private institutions playing a role in the public life of the state? What is our role, for instance, in promoting K through 12 education? Uh, how do you think about the role of the liberal arts in a functioning democracy? Um, what do you think we should be working on here? Well, thanks for the question. You know, um, earlier today I happened to be in an event with some folks in this room um, who I had the pleasure of serving with, Minnie Dom and Joe Comerford, and I see Dave Sullivan in the audience. Um, an event, affordable housing project, right next door, right alongside the track. And the reason I mention it is it's, it's important. That's an affordable housing uh, project that is now housing 28 individuals who did not have housing before this. And it's cool, it's great, you know, it's passive housing, which, um, you know, of course, Amherst is always an innovator and leader. Um, so it's good for the climate. It's, uh, it's an example, though, of how a private institution like the college can live alongside community and with community because those residents, many of whom have complex needs, are able to take advantage of the premises here and, and the green space and the athletic facilities. And that's a really uh, important thing. It's, a, it's an example. Look, uh, our destinies, we're tied to one another, okay? You understand that Massachusetts is a state one of the few that enshrines the right to an education in our state mm. constitution. We are proud to be home to the first public school, the first public library, right? These things are part of our DNA. So, so important. And I think that it is incumbent upon our private and public colleges and universities to not just exist within the walls uh, of, of, of their institutions, and premises, but to really be part of community. It's also incumbent upon those of us in government and community to engage with our private institutions and our public institutions. That can take a variety of forms. The tutoring, the mentoring. Uh, I know that I did that in college for students in grades three through eight, I think, mm -hmm. and it was really meaningful. There are so many different ways that both students and faculty can volunteer time, can mentor, um, and can uh, contribute in addition to the ways you contribute through the work that you do here, the study that you do. I'm all for knowledge. I am really, really all for applied knowledge. You know what I mean? Like, let's make it happen. So give us the ideas that we need to put in place. Um, and, you know, that's something we need to do. I really appreciate what Aiden and Theo said about democracy, too, and I applaud the, the work here and totally uh, endorse uh, the, the call to action. Um, but, but one of the things that, that, um, that they talked about was uh, the need to, to, to get engaged with, with activism and community. And one thing that it reminded me of here um, is, is the role you all play as, as truth tellers. And in this time, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom, combating misinformation, uh, standing up for truth, you know, that is just so fundamental to democracy, and that is something that this institution and its students and faculty can contribute to every single day. Thank you. Thank you. Let me add one more thing, because it relates to democracy. You're the governor. Community, no, no. But community newspapers, okay? Really, really important to democracy. And unfortunately, they've been starved all over this country and run into the ground and bought up by these big conglomerates. If you can have some time and interest, go to school board meetings, you know, go to town meeting, um, engage and report on community, whether you're here in Massachusetts or uh, back in states where maybe you, you, you're from, um, that's something that may seem small, but it actually really matters to the fundamentals of democracy. Thank you, thank you. Um, let me switch a little bit 
One of the things you and I agree about is the importance of all facets of diversity in terms of educating students who will go on to become the leaders in democratic society. Uh, we're at this institution, like many others, facing challenges after the Supreme Court's decision that limits our ability to think about race as part of the admissions process. How do you and your role as governor and in the State House think about the role the state of Massachusetts can play in terms of increasing the number of levers that make sure that we have a truly diverse student body in institutions of higher education? Yeah. Well, it was, a, it was really a terrible Supreme Court decision and flawed, misguided. It's also one we unfortunately an anticipated. And so we formed an advisory council um, last spring to think about what we could do here in the state. And we recently issued, working with the Attorney General's Office here, guidance to our colleges and universities uh, just to assure them that uh, so much of the, so 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 many of their efforts to ensure diversity are actually still perfectly fine to continue with, and you should. It is also the case that I think we need to double down on other kinds of innovations and investments, and this really gets to to dealing with um, the pipeline of students and specifically making sure that there are things like early education and childcare. Yes, there are free school breakfasts and lunch because little kids can't really learn on an empty belly. Making sure we deal with health equity and housing equity, right, and, and, and economic injustice and, and trying to, to, to solve for that. Um, it, it's a time, I think, where we really have to engage that way. It's also uh, important that we worked, I think, here in the state with the legislature to do a th few things through the budget, increase college pathways for students in high school, making it easier for students to earn college credit, to get on a pathway to college earlier on in the K through 12 process. And I know that many institutions are thinking about ways to invest earlier in the pipeline, in the K through 12 pipeline. I think you know, that is, that is gonna be more critical than ever. Um, given, um, given the recent decision. It's something we should be doing anyways, mm -hmm. but I think it just really uh, drives home the need to make sure we're doing all we can to foster and develop that, that pipeline. It's not like kids aren't out there. It's also the case that there are any number of kids who never would think of stepping foot on the Amherst College campus if somebody didn't tell them about it, if they weren't exposed to it. And there's some little kid right now in some little town, you know, it could be in Texas, it could be in New Hampshire, it could be in Nebraska, who's not thinking about this. It could be in Holyoke. And I say that because this is where it gets back to the role of private institutions. It's a big world out there, but everything comes back to community and what is immediate around you as well. And don't lose, don't lose sight of that. Uh, don't lose sight of that. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder about our obligation to think about our local, our local community. I want to ask you a question about strengthening democratic discourse, right? strengthening democratic engagement. Um, as, as Aidan and Theo were talking about, and I mentioned my remarks, we live in a moment when it feels like there's a coarsening of rhetoric, when it feels nearly impossible, and I think some, many of us have experienced this, especially over the last three to four weeks uh, to have any real conversation across political divides. We're trying to work on this here at Amherst. We think this is something that we should be able to do better at strengthening a sense of civic discourse. How do you think about that question? How do you think about steps that we can be taking or do you have advice for us as we embark on that journey? Um, I, I wish I had sort of uh, advice and here are the how to's and if we do these things it will happen. Uh, you're absolutely right. We're in a time right now where there seems to be not just a fragility when it comes to thinking about democracy and, and basic fundamentals, but, but also a breakdown in discourse. And the historians in the room would probably point to other periods of time where there were similar levels of, of um, incivility, we'll call it, right? But I think in this moment, look, it's important that we foster um, the ability to talk with one another and reinforce uh, forums where we can listen to one another and engage in discussion and differences of opinion and views. And that's what is supposed to make us healthier and stronger. 
as a pluralistic society, as democracy. So that's all, that's all important, and we should, we should do that. We should protect the First Amendment and the right to engage in, in, those, uh, in a diversity of thought and, and expression of views. It is also the case, and I believe in this, and I was a civil rights lawyer, there are certain things that are non-negotiable. And I see, unfortunately, and it's in, in recent years, a growing willingness to abandon truth, facts, science, all in the further exploitation of, of, some, of some end. It's not good for this country. It's not good for this world. And I also think that certain things also are non-negotiable. Hate. You know, the rise of anti-Semitism, the rise of Islamophobia, the rise of white supremacy. So both things can be true at one time. Um, there's a way to engage and, and there's a way that, you know, ultimately I think is really corrosive to, uh, to, to uh, humanity and, and, you know, the, the furtherance of um, um, growth and health and development in, in this world. That's, uh, that's how I see it anyways. Thank you, thank you. Um, we'll turn to some student questions in a second, but let me give you one more chance to maybe reflect on your career in public service. As you think back, are there things that you would change? Has it lived up to your expectations? Is there advice that you would have for the students who are here tonight who might be considering a career in public service? I would say go for it. I can't, you know, I, I've been lucky. I, I, um, I was a pro basketball player. I worked at a, at a big law firm, and, um, and I made some money for a little bit, which was good because I had a lot of loans to, to pay down. <laughs> um, but I got to tell you, I am, so, um, I am so glad that I jumped in and did this public service thing. And, you know, probably if I had to do it over again, I would have done it sooner. Mm. I would have done it sooner because nothing will be as gratifying. And we need you. We need talented people. Um, I'd say we need talented people in state government because right now the laboratories for whether it's how to combat gun violence, how to protect the environment and deal with climate, you know, how to solve a housing crisis, the innovations in transportation, the action is at the state level, actually. And I'd say it's in Massachusetts. I hope many of you <laughs> stay in Massachusetts. We want you not only to come to school here, but to grow businesses here and families here and livelihoods here. Um, but I can't strongly enough encourage public service. And you know, you, you have a way to impact people's lives that is so profound. And there are a whole bunch of different jobs. We've got engineers, we've got financial wizards, we've got policy wonks, right? So you don't have to be somebody like me out in front of a camera or running for office. There are so many ways to serve in government and really, truly, nothing you do, I don't believe, will be as interesting um, and as satisfying. And you know, it's important to be able to support yourself um, it's good to be able to support your partners and your family and kids someday, right? Like that's all important stuff. It's also the case that the satisfaction I know I've found has come through work in government and through work in public service. So I put a big time plug in. Um, it is also, as I say, where the action is at. And so many of you I know in this crowd are so engaged in the efforts around democracy. Democracy is local. You know, it is about voting. I mentioned community newspapers. It's about who's running for school committee, right? You see what some school committees are doing around this country. You see what some governors are doing around this country, right? So you can be in government as a force for good or a force for less desirable things, but government's, um, government's a, it's a, it's a great thing and we need great people in, in government. And I think this country needs great people in government right now. Sure enough, there are any number of undesirable folks uh, who you see on TV all the time, right? Um, we, we, need, we need more support and we need more help and we will be, um, we'll be stronger for it, but I would just say that you will really, really enjoy it. I, I stay in it. I mean, and these jobs are not, you know, I joke about not playing basketball. I don't get to see my partner as much. Like we don't, you know, it's hard. It's hard on family. It's hard. It's hard. Eris is a lovely place for a getaway weekend. Well, that's right. We, we'll, make a, we'll make a note of that. We love, we love Amherst. We love the 413. That's, uh, that's for sure. I actually started my campaign for attorney general out here. So this is, this is you know, I'm touching the well. 
Um, but it's just to say that there's nothing, there's nothing like it. And so I, um, I also, I also want to say thank you to the Amherst community too, because when I got elected governor, one of the one of the things that they ask you to do is to hang a portrait of a former governor in your office for inspiration. And I thought, and I thought, and I thought some more, and then I finally said, you know what, I'm going to actually ask young people in Massachusetts to help me out. And I received an essay from students in Western Massachusetts uh, who came together from Springfield, Holyoke, and Amherst. And the essay I received was this, Governor, you should hang a frame with no portrait and let it symbolize two things. Every morning when you walk in, think of those who are voiceless, who are vulnerable, who are not seen and not walking the halls of power, and let that guide and inform your work every single day. And, and, and then they said, Governor, don't be looking at the past for inspiration, look to the future. And so now when the school kids come in to my office as they do, they can take a picture and superimpose themselves, right? Oh. In the frame, which is what you want. Because when we say representation matters, seeing is believing, you know, unless people are there, you know, people aren't gonna be inspired or even know that something is possible. So I just wanna say I'm really grateful to the young people, particularly here in the 413, for giving me that inspiration. And don't you know, I get to tell that story just about every day, sometimes four times a day, to everybody who comes into my office, which is great. Well, well you tell it well, and it's, it's an inspiring story. And the pleasure and passion that you bring to the work that you do is one of the best advertisements possible for public service. So thank you. So if it's OK with you, we're going to have some, uh, students ask a few questions we came, they submitted great. beforehand. And then we're going to start with Ahmed Ali. Hi, um, first, thank you so much for coming down here to Western Mass. It's very apparent that you really love us. And uh, <laughs> thank you, President Elliott, for having this. Um, I'll introduce myself first, and then I'll go into the question. I'm Ahmed Ali, class of 2024, senior in political science and computer science. I'm not American, but I'm from the strongest democracy in the world right now, Egypt. Um, and so my question to you is, um, today in an increasingly connected an undemocratic world, what are our duties, citizens and non-citizens, to promote and maintain our democracy? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that question. It's, you know, it's something I think about every single day, and I think that there are really concrete things that all of you can do. You can get engaged in your own democracy in community. Make sure that you're registered to vote. Make sure that you're voting if you're eligible to vote. Make sure that you're paying attention to who's in office or who's running for office and get behind and support people who are gonna do the things that you think should be done in our democratic society. Uh, make sure that you are taking all steps to fight against what seems to be a rise in some places of authoritarianism and you know, activity that just, um, if, if continued, leads to the downfall of, of the kind of society that I think many have taken for granted in this country at least for a while and you know that gets to fighting for things like truth and facts do the research check the sources you know push out real information truthful information fight disinformation um, engage too with people who are different from you and think maybe think differently and um, I say that just because I think we're richer for for broadening our perspectives and, and our views and sometimes that's hard Right, I get it, and I, you know, I got to engage with a lot of different people with a lot of views. Um, some of them don't like a lot of what I'm doing, but, you know, I think this, this, this matters. Um, you know, and and I'd say, you know, just continue to to think about uh, locally your action and activity, um, while also, of course, fighting, you know, for things on on a broader scale. But um, your computer science, you know, look, we've got AI coming; it can do wonderful things. But also, you know, what it means for, for what is already a huge problem when it comes to misinformation, disinformation. It's something we've got to fix, we've got to solve for. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, our next question comes from Sonia Shaji Wide. Mm 
Hi, thank you so much for being here, Governor Healy. Um, my name is Sonia Shaje wides I'm a junior history major from Brooklyn, New York. Um, and my question is about transportation and specifically what your priorities are for public transportation in Massachusetts and moreover, how you think about public transportation as fitting into a functioning democracy. Yeah, well, thank you for, thank you for the question. Um, I think if you were in Ukraine right now, I'm told that the trains are still working. That's how important it is. And actually, the fellow who's in charge of transportation is now, I think, in charge of much of the war effort there. Um, it's a little bit of an aside, but you know, I just, <laughs> it's not something that we've done particularly well here in this country. And we need to, we've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, I'll say this, public transportation, it's a public good. It is a public good. And so my job as governor here in Massachusetts is to do everything I can to make sure that we have a public transit system that is safe and reliable. It also has to be a public transit system that is truly accessible to the entirety of the public. Recognizing here, we've got regional buses, right? A um, little different from the subways that we have right in and around greater Boston. Um, it's why I have invested a lot in this and spent a lot of time um, taking steps to bring in new management, new leadership, hire a bunch more workers at, um, at the MBTA, which is our Greater Boston Subway System and, and Commuter Rail System. It's why I went hard after money coming from the Biden administration. We were able to get just over $100 million that's going to support important infrastructure in central and western Massachusetts for West East Rail, which is really important. And it's why I brought a team of, of um, in a, new, new innovators and thinkers about how we think about transportation and who are down with the view that um, transportation is a public good. You have to be able to get around. Um, and that includes all over Western Massachusetts where you know, you're talking about somebody's ability to get to a doctor, to get to a clinic, um, to get to a job, to get to school. It is, it is so important and that's why you know, we have to make those investments. And I wish more had been done um, and more had been done earlier. But as long as I'm governor, I'm going to work with my friends in the legislature to do everything that we can to provide a uh, first class public transit system here in Massachusetts. Thank you. Let me, let me next welcome the microphone from Egla Belizer. Good evening, um, Governor Healy. I would first just like to thank you for coming out here tonight. Um, my name is Egla, and um, I'm a first year. Uh, I'm also a prospective law, jurisprudence, and social thought major from Houston, Texas. Any yeah. um, yeah. out here? Um, and I was just curious about what your administration is doing to tackle the issue of affordable housing here in Massachusetts. And do you think there are any current obstacles um, standing in the way of progress? <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Uh, there are a lot of obstacles, right? Um, we've got inflation right now, which you know is really driving up the cost of goods and supplies and all the stuff that it takes to, to actually build housing. Um, it's also the case we've got really high interest rates. I just left a development in Worcester earlier today where, you know, when they finished that project, which we celebrated today, creating a bunch more affordable housing out of what used to be an old courthouse, the interest rate was about 1.7%. Today, for their next project, the interest rate is 8%. So there are real barriers. There are also barriers that are created by community. Exclusionary zoning practices, for example, um, being one. And so what we did, because it is such a big priority, to me, this is like the greatest challenge for our state. Mm. Um, it is the greatest challenge. And it's going to be, you know, it, it, it goes to whether or not people are able to stay here. We have so many people, like yourself, I want you to stay here, okay? I don't want you to move back to Texas. You can visit family and others. <laughs> I, want I want you in Massachusetts. But you're only going to be in Massachusetts if you can afford to live here, if you can afford rent, if you can afford someday to buy a home. Um, we want you to have a job, but employers aren't going to be able to stay here or grow here if they can't retain and attract a talented workforce. So it is a, an economic imperative 
that we do everything we can to supercharge housing production in the state, which requires doing things differently. So here's what I did when I started. I created a Secretary of Housing and Livable Communities for the first time ever in our state's history, because I want somebody and a team focused on housing production. My climate chief, who is first in the nation, she's really terrific, set up a climate bank. It's um, the first of its kind in the country because it's going to be directed towards growing affordable housing. It's why we saw it through the budget, um, historic levels of investment in housing programs, increasing uh, funding for certain programs, both affordable and market rate, tax credits recently to try to incent more development of affordable housing, and last week filed something called the um, Affordable Homes Act, but it basically it's a $4 billion uh, piece of legislation where we're looking for um, bond money, capital authorization money to go out and do things to build more housing. And we got a whole lot of policies associated with that, but it's really, really important. It is the, the number one thing that I am focused on right now because um, so much turns on, on our ability or inability to create affordable housing here in the state. Thank you. I, I appreciate the answer. I love the fact that you are recruiting the future leaders of Massachusetts one student at a time. Yes. Really grassroots politics at its yes. best. Um, let me invite Stella Yuan to come to the microphone for, for the next question. Thank Hi. Thank you for coming here. My name is Stella Yuan. I'm a sophomore and a chemistry major, and I'm from Milton, Massachusetts. Okay. Well, I need you to stay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my question is, what is a goal unique to the civic education system in central and western Massachusetts, and how may Amherst College help the region? It's a great question. You know, civics education, it's great that Massachusetts, we now have by law civics education in the schools, but... You know, that's only as good as it, as it is um, able to be implemented. And that's why making sure that, you know, school districts have the support, have the funding to implement civics education, that their educators are actually taught <laughs> and schooled up on what civic ed education should look like is really important. I think the role, you know, you all can play working with kids, you know, getting into schools. Can you mentor? Can you volunteer? I mean, you can go like do a debate program and in the course you can talk about government and how government really works. So you can work with a group of students. I love it. They come forward with ideas for like a state bird or a state song or a state ice cream. Like it, but in the process, they're learning about how laws are made, how government functions. And, you know, if there's anything I can say about um, the last eight years uh, or so of, of my experience and frustration as a politician, it's the failure of so many to apprehend how government actually works. And I'm also talking about people in really successful positions, you know, who've achieved and are out there. They have no clue. They think I'm governor, I can do anything, right? That they don't understand there's a legislative process or they don't understand fundamentally how things get done. They can talk on and on about things, but you know, they're also the same people who aren't voting or engaged in their local school elections, right? So it's like you guys have the power to actually help, you know, bring an education to young people through volunteering, through mentoring and through your own votes in places, making sure you know, that you're supporting those who are gonna actually not just fund civics education, but also make sure that it's implemented. And you know, I, I just feel like so many things, things might have been different um, uh, in any number of elections had people really understood you know, what, who's responsible um, and therefore who needs to be held accountable. And, you know, what kind of person you should be expecting to do, what's realistic um, in an age where people running for office can say and promise any number of things, true or not. Um, it's important that people understand. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, our last question this evening is from Jackson Herson. Jackson. Good evening, Governor Healy. My name is Jackson, it's nice to meet you. Um, I actually come from Sutton, Massachusetts, a little cow town. Um, I'm majoring in journalism, so just on behalf of my generation, I would like to ask. Uh, my generation at the moment is very concerned with the state of the world. 
What advice would you give young people in promoting governmental change on topics such as climate change, political unrest, and future global challenges? Yeah, well, Jackson, um, thanks for the question. And I grew up in a little, what'd you call it, a cow town? I grew up in a little cow town, <laughs> too. Um, 1,700 people. It's now probably up to 2,200 people. So I know a little something of where you're from. And I know Sutton, love Sutton. Here's what I'd say. Um, first of all, just you know, it is understandable to be frustrated because you all have inherited any number of problems, not of your making, um, but, but you're certainly burdened with that. You cannot lose hope or faith. Um, I would say just get in the game and find a way to get involved. And this, is, this will go back to my um, shameless pitch for, for public service. Whether or not you grow up and decide you're gonna go work in government or not, it's never too late to do an internship to get involved, right? Because you know it's important for climate, for example, right? Climate, you know, it, it can be so daunting and overwhelming when you think about all that we're facing when it comes to climate. When you think about how we need to decarbonize, right, and the work that we need to do, that you can just throw up your hands. But we don't have the luxury of that. You know, we don't have the luxury of that, nor do we want that, right? I mean, you have to be optimistic too, um, but you have to get involved, and so. Consider, go work for a legislator, you know? Work for a legislator who's, who's shaping actual policy on the ground and what that looks like. Get involved in community in implementing that policy, whether it's climate action related to housing or to transportation, two big sectors that we gotta decarbonize, right? So I, I would say to, to young people, the more you can actually get involved in the, in the hands-on work, the doing of things, um, it's important to call attention, it's important, and I understand rallies and protests and speaking out and all of that, but the single best way to make change is be the change maker. And the way you do that is by being in the room or supporting those who are in the room and pushing and working for that policy. And you know, um, you guys, you guys, look, you're here. You're here, you've got tremendous privilege. You've worked hard for this, you've worked hard for this. Um, but you'll leave Amherst College with a privilege that not everyone has. And with that privilege comes both a responsibility, in my view, and also an opportunity, a huge opportunity, because the world needs you. The world needs you, and the world awaits you. But don't wait for the world either. Thank you. Thank you. Responsibility and opportunity, that's a, a great place to end a really special evening. I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank everybody who helped to support this event, students for asking the questions, and especially thank the governor for being here. We are welcome back at Amherst College well, anytime, governor. Thank and you so much. Thank you for having me.